the Chem Activity number 11, we're going to start our exploration of rates of reaction. In particular, in this video, we will be exploring why we study rates of reaction and how does the balanced equation relate to the reported rates of reaction. In terms of why we study rates of reaction, well, if we were industrial chemists, we may want to be optimizing a certain industrial process. We may want to speed up the rate at which a certain chemical is produced, or perhaps slow it down, or maximize the yield in a particular amount of time. Another reason why we would study the rates of reaction is it gives us an indirect sense of what's going on at the molecular level. And we'll be addressing this issue a little bit later in this particular unit. Another reason why we may want to be studying rates of reaction is if we're interested in, for instance, environmental chemistry. And so you see here a picture of an American or Canadian city at a particular time in the day. In one case, on the left, we have a haze. And so environmental chemists have noticed that at certain times of the day, haze will be produced. They'll want to know why is that haze produced. They'll want to know how quickly and at what time of the day and how quickly it disperses. What are the underlying chemical reactions that result in having that haze? So in your course pack, you see a framework for making a graph. And this represents the distribution of gases, let's say in a city, over the course of a day. And so I'd like you to trace out the production of these gases. So for instance, the nitrogen monoxide, the nitrogen dioxide, and the ozone. You can see that they appear or maximize their levels at certain times of the day. And then of course we also have these hydrocarbons that are produced. You may want to stop the video and trace out these lines. So here are some of the underlying reactions that are happening. The nitrogen monoxide is produced as the result of production in cars. And so the idea is, of course, we really just want to burn the gasoline and generate energy from there. But nitrogen is in the air. And as a result of the high temperatures in the combustion engine, nitrogen and oxygen also combine and produce this nitrogen monoxide. Now, the nitrogen monoxide's levels seem to peak around 8 o'clock in the morning. The nitrogen monoxide goes on to react with oxygen in the air and produces this nitrogen dioxide. This is a brownish gas. This is the haze that we see in our industrial cities. And then, over time, the nitrogen dioxide disperses. In part, that could be weather patterns and things. But the nitrogen oxide actually goes on and decomposes, again, back to nitrogen monoxide and atomic oxygen. Now, atomic oxygen is particularly reactive and can react further with diatomic oxygen to produce ozone. Now, I'm sure we're all aware of ozone in the stratosphere as a protecting gas from UV radiation. But if ozone's generated, let's say, at the street level, it can cause respiratory problems. So it's considered as a pollutant. So we can think of nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and ozone as all pollutants. And their levels be maximized at certain levels in the day. And so we can monitor the rate of production and dispersion. So this would be relatively important for an environmental chemist. At this stage, I'd like to take one of these reactions and focus a little bit how we monitor or what we're looking for when we measure the rate of reaction. So for this first reaction, let's say between nitrogen and oxygen to produce the nitrogen monoxide, I'm showing here the balanced equation and a graph that shows the generation of nitrogen monoxide over time and the decomposition of nitrogen gas and oxygen gas in that same time frame. Normally in these plots, in the y-axis we show concentration and in the x-axis we show time. Because these measurements are being made over a very short period of time, you can see that they're being shown in the micromolar level as well as microsecond level you can monitor either the production of products or the consumption of reactants to monitor the rate of a reaction. Now, of course, any time that you're monitoring a rate, it is going to involve a certain time component. So, for instance, the rate of production of nitrogen monoxide could be expressed as the change in nitrogen monoxide concentration 
as a function of a change in time. Now, certainly those of you who are studying calculus will know all about the idea of changes over changes these sort of differential types of equations. But for our purpose, we'll be focusing simply on the delta sign here and doing calculations that involve final minus initial concentrations. So, for instance, if we want to monitor the change in concentration of nitrogen monoxide, it would look something like this. The concentration final minus the concentration initial over T final minus T initial. Now note that whenever we do calculate change, it should always be final minus initial. Now I'd like to remind you that the units for this will be, in this particular case, micromolar over microsecond. In general, it will be molar per second or molar per some time. So what doesn't change is generally the rates are expressed as a function of concentration per time. It doesn't always, as I say, have to be seconds. Now, the reason why I lay this out here is I'm not interested in doing a calculation, but I would like to emphasize the sign of the value that you will get here. Because we're monitoring the production of a product, and the product final will be larger than the product initial, we would expect that this value here will be a positive value. And of course, our time value will be a positive value. Therefore, the rate will be expressed as a positive value. I also would like to point out that we can cancel out the micros here, and therefore the units for this rate of reaction can simply be molar per second, or we'll often represent it as molar second to the minus one. So we can monitor the rate by following the production of a product. We can also follow the rate by following the decomposition of the reactant. So this would look something like this. Now I said the rate of decomposition. We can also phrase that as the rate of consumption. Now I'm focusing on the nitrogen gas, but of course we could also focus on the oxygen gas. So change in concentration of the nitrogen is a change in time. Once again, the same kind of calculation and nitrogen concentration final minus nitrogen concentration initial, T final minus T initial. Now because the nitrogen concentration final is smaller than the nitrogen concentration initial, we would expect that the result of that calculation would give us a negative number. The time value will still be a positive value. Therefore, we would expect a negative answer in terms of this initial calculation. So here's something that I'd like to point out. In terms of chemistry, we don't normally deal with negative rates. I know in physics we can talk about negative rates in terms of the direction in which something is moving. But in this particular case, in chemistry, we always want to have a positive rate. Now there's different ways of doing this, but by definition, a change is final minus initial. Therefore, what we do is we put a negative sign in front of the expression delta concentration of nitrogen over delta T. So by definition, the rate of consumption of nitrogen gas is equal to negative delta nitrogen gas over delta T. Therefore, it will be a negative value times a negative value. So I'm also going to put the negative right here. So ultimately, this number will also be a positive value. So in the end, our rate will be a positive value. And once again, of course, the units here will be molar per second or molar second to the minus one. So as mentioned, we can monitor the rate of this reaction by either following the production of nitrogen monoxide or the consumption of nitrogen gas or oxygen gas. The exact equation looks a little bit different depending if it's a product or a reactant. I need to introduce one other term here, and this is the rate of reaction. Now at the bottom of this first page of the chem activity number 11, you see a worried looking test tube right next to the worried looking test tube is a definition of the rate of reaction. The rate of reaction is defined to be the rate of consumption of a reactant 
or the rate of production of a product whose stoichiometry coefficient is 1 in the balanced chemical equation. The rate of reaction can be expressed in terms of the rate of change in concentration of any of the reactants or products. The key here that I want you to focus on is the stoichiometry coefficient of 1. This makes a difference. Now, to explain to you why we do this, the idea is no matter how we measure the rate of reaction, we always want to end up with one answer. To do this, therefore, we specifically define that the rate will correspond to the stoichiometry coefficient of 1. Let me show you how this would work here on the slide. So when we say rate of reaction, we mean something very specific. It's going to be either the change in concentration of the nitrogen over time or the production of nitrogen monoxide over time, but we need to make sure that it corresponds to a coefficient of 1. Now you will notice that in the balanced equation here, we have two moles of nitrogen monoxide produced for every one mole of nitrogen gas consumed. Therefore, what we need to do is put a half right next to the change in concentration of nitrogen monoxide. That means that whatever the value is, it will be divided by 2. And therefore, this statement that I'm writing here will be equivalent after I have added a negative sign here. So, for one, the change in concentration of the nitrogen gas, if we don't do anything else, will be a negative value. So we'll multiply that by a negative sign. The change in concentration of nitrogen monoxide will be twice as large as the change in concentration of nitrogen gas in that same amount of time. So we'll divide by 2. When we make those changes, then this is a completely equivalent and an appropriate statement amongst these different variables and defines the rate of reaction. So sometimes we use the word loosely, oh, rate of reaction. But in chemistry, this has a very specific definition. As I say, it has to be the rate corresponding to a coefficient of 1. As a final point on this slide, you may want to reinvestigate the graph that's on the left-hand side here and look at the slopes of these lines. One, the production of the nitrogen monoxide versus the consumption of nitrogen or oxygen gas. And just to connect to the idea that the product is being produced at a different rate than the reactant is being consumed. So for instance, if we take a look at the slope right here. So when we talk about rates, it does really connect to the idea of slope. So hopefully you can see that the slope in production of nitrogen monoxide gas is, in fact, twice as steep as the slope in the consumption of the nitrogen and the oxygen gas. And again, this ties to the coefficient of the two here. So once again, we define the rate of reaction so that we always end up with the same number regardless of how we actually measure that number. We acknowledge that the production of nitrogen monoxide will be twice as fast as the consumption of nitrogen or oxygen, but based on our definition of rate of reaction, we will always end up with one particular value in units of molar per second. In our live sessions, We'll do some examples of calculations. We'll do some examples of relating various equations and hopefully clarify any concerns that you have about this topic.